A few months ago we discovered someone on social media who was holding a full pledge for 10 seconds, who was doing full front lever, and this guy wasn't the ordinary calisthenics guy. He was over 2 meters tall and over 100 kg heavy. Extreme height, extreme weight, extreme aesthetics, this meant we needed to do this interview. I'm extremely happy to be able to present you today the 50th episode of the Athlete Insider Podcast with a really special guest, a special episode. Jack was kind enough to talk about his workout advice, his planche advice, how to select a coach and how to reach your goals quicker. It's not perfect for him, his legs are bent. I say, I say, I say, you're right. It's right. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Again, we provide all the details and all the chapters for the stuff that we talk about. So you can select the part that is interesting for you. Feel free to watch it till the end because there are a lot of interesting things in it. Enjoy and keep growing, guys. You gorillas, welcome to the Athlete Insider Podcast by Gore Nation. My name is Phil and today's episode is a special episode with a special guest, with a guest that is uh, inspiring the calisthenics community with his extreme statics. And it's not only that he does full planche and front lever, but he is like, uh, he has a special physique, let's say. And uh, with his two meters, two centimeters and 103 kg, I'm really happy to welcome you to the show from Italy, Jack Vinati. Hello, everybody. Jack, so I'm happy that you fit into the camera, which is like you already look huge, <laughs> huge on camera. This is uh, really like, <laughs> I'm, it's a really, ple it's a real pleasure to talk with you and to do this interview. So um, we received a lot of questions from the community, but first of all, uh, yeah, maybe for the US listeners, uh, you're mm -hmm. six feet seven, I guess. Uh, I six think. feet seven inches tall and yes. 225 pounds. Yes, that's insane. So, um, yeah, do you want to kick off presenting yourself? Who are you? What do you do? Yeah. Um, hello, everybody. My name is Giacomo Vinati, but everybody calls me Jack. Yeah, this reminds me the Daft Punk meme. Yeah, it's funny. <laughs> I'm a software engineer and a, and a sort of calisthenics athlete. I say I said sort because I cannot be a real athlete until I participate uh, in a competition. I played basketball for 11 years. I was also a professional one, but at the age of 22, I quit due to a crossed and collateral ligaments uh, knee injury. And from there, I started going to the gym for three, four years until I discovered calisthenics. Wow. Basketball. That's uh, yeah. something I, we received some questions here. Why don't you play basketball with your height? Uh, but you, you already did. <laughs> you, yeah. You already uh, crossed that chapter. And I've already um, quit. <laughs> insane. Uh, did did uh, the, the, your career in basketball bring you something for calisthenics or is it a completely, mm, completely different uh, thing? I, I think it's completely different. Yeah, yeah. completely Okay, so not even mindset things or like the competitive uh, attitude that you. That oh, you maybe have. no. Or for for is uh, so for the mental uh, competition. Yeah, I say yeah. I can say yeah. I agree, but um, dude, it's not a physical. Uh, so I, it's a totally different, totally different sport. Sure. So it's I, I had to start from scratch. <laughs> Yeah, I can imagine. And have you been that massive already playing basketball, or uh, did you start eating more when you uh, when you start your your workout? Maybe I started eating more when I started doing calisthenics, mm, but not too much more than before. It was okay. almost the same, more or less. Okay. Cool. Then, uh, yeah, let's jump into your beginnings with calisthenics, uh, with uh, the static workout. Let us uh, let us know how did you start uh, with the sport? How were your beginnings? Uh, why did you start okay. with calisthenics and not with the typical okay. gym stuff? Okay, I I remember what, three three and a half years ago, uh, a video called Calisthenics Street Workout appeared on my YouTube home, and it had millions of views. And I had never heard this name, calisthenics, and I was intrigued about it. So I watched it and, and was amazed by the skills of this athlete. It was Frank Medrano, <laughs> <laughs> who did the front lever, dragon flag, and stand push-ups, one-arm pull-ups. And I thought, 
cool, I want to do it too. And so I started looking for coaches in my city, but I couldn't find anyone. And the same time, I remember many told me that I was too tall and too heavy for this sport and that I would never make it. So I just wanted to prove to everyone that they were wrong and that even someone two meters tall and 100 kilo uh, weight could be able to do skill. Uh, so it has become a challenge against everyone and above all against myself. Wow. Well. There you already like said so many uh, valuable and interesting things. Um, so first of all, you directly looked for a coach, right? Um, where yeah. did this this idea come from? Because most of the calisthenics people, they start training, they look up tutorials, they try by their sel themselves. They, I don't know. Yeah, because I, I started maybe, I, I, I tried for two, three months to tr train, uh, just looking, just watching the YouTube uh, videos, but um, nothing changed, nothing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so uh, one of my friends told me, I remember, there is a really good coach in Verona, is a, is a city, is a, um, one hour far from here. Uh, and so I, I text him. And uh, at first he said the same thing. No, you <laughs> cannot do it. You too tall, you too heavy. And I said, please, uh, let me show you uh, for maybe two, three, four months. Uh, follow me and uh, I will show you that maybe I can do, I can prove you wrong. Okay. So your goal was always statics or did you start with uh, like the, the goal of a muscle up or some reps? Mm, more, uh, yeah, yeah, it was more a, a thing of, of, about, uh, of skills more than aesthetic or body. Uh, so I wanted to, uh, I was impressed by the full plunge. The full plunge, uh, I think it's my favorite skill. And, and I said, I, I want to do that. Wow. A lot of people told you that you aren't able to do that. Like um, that uh, even your coach says, no, I, I won't coach you. You're like uh, too, too yeah, big, at first, too tall yeah. at first, of course. Um, so what, what did that make with you? Like what, uh, what were your thoughts? Like, uh, did you always have this contrary thinking that you thought, yeah, I will prove you. I will. Yeah. Prove yeah. You yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. I, I, I always thought I, I don't mind. I don't mind of others people thought. Okay. And um, yeah, did you feel that it was heavier? Like you don't have the comparison, you're, you know, like um, I think the last time you were one meter 50, it was being 10 years old or something. <laughs> so you don't have the comparison. But... Yeah, are you meaning at, at the beginning or yeah. in general? At the, beginning, at the beginning, I remember definitely. that at, at first, the first few months, uh, I found it hard just hang on the bar for more than 20 seconds. Wow. And I remember that my hands and forearms always hurt. It was difficult and not very motivating at the beginning because I, I felt like more, a little dumb doing trivial exercises uh, such as plank on the ground or hollow position. And I always thought uh, I'd never make it or it will take me forever to reach just one skill. But when I start achieving my first skills, uh, just like the front lever, I began to understand what calisthenics is. So, so it's completely different sport from the others. So uh, let me explain. Uh, um, it's not like bodybuilding or powerlifting where no atten attention is paid uh, to joint mobility. And in calisthenics, the technique is even more important because you um, almost always work with your whole body when you perform a skill. Uh, so there must be a new um, a unique synergy. You have to feel your body completely. For example, when you do the handstand, it's not it's not uh, it's not easy. You have to understand how to feel uh, how the feet are positioned, the shoulder, the retroversion, the retroversion of the pelvis. Uh, uh, thinking about pushing up against uh, the ground with shoulders, 
And all this must be done at the same time. This is why I think it's more difficult and more satisfying or rewarding than other sports. It's like becoming a sort of accelerometer and gyroscope at the same time. You have to know your, your, the position of uh, each, uh, each part of your body in space. Yeah. Yeah, it's a bit strange. Yeah. So, um, like... It wasn't easy in the beginning. So did you always uh, like ever had the thoughts of uh, quitting or stopping? Mm, I never, I never thought about giving up. And if I were able to achieve all the skill that I, skills that I like and participate in some competition, maybe two or three, maybe I could dedicate myself to pure strength exercise and give up with the skill. I don't know, maybe uh, weighted dips, weighted pull-ups, deadlifts, and squat. I don't know. Yeah. And uh, is your goal to compete uh, in, the, in, the, in the near future or in the future? Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. But I think is uh, it's very hard because uh, there is uh, there are no weight categories at all. Mm -hmm. And I think I would never win uh, a competition. But I don't mind. I don't mind. So you would also compete just for the experience and... Uh, just for fun. Yeah, yeah. for saying uh, I did it. I prove everybody that I did it. Yeah. And I like, I, I imagine this situation, you competing and like everybody just, whoa, whoa. Like, uh, I think the, the, it would be priceless to see all the faces uh, like of the people seeing that it's possible and uh, that their excuse of weight or height isn't, isn't, uh, isn't right. And um, yeah, I think like you're inspiring a lot of athletes out there because especially the tall athletes are feeling um, a lot of like, we receive a lot of questions and uh, comments and messages of uh, tall athletes who are like not discouraged, but like they need more motivation than small athletes because they have it hard. Yeah. Yeah. Because, um, I, especially, I never thought at the word impossible, but more difficult to achieve. For example, an average athlete takes the full plunge maybe in a few months. Instead, it took me over two years. Sometimes it's frustrating, but my motto is uh, slowly but surely. <laughs> so never be in a hurry, even if the improvements are tiny. I also want to add a little truth because uh, very often I read comments from people who say that tall person make, makes the same effort as shorter one and is a lot it's a com totally it's a complete lie uh, so it's a physics question so it's let's take a little physical physics lesson mm -hmm. if you have longer levers um, a larger weight force than normal acts on them And this is a double disadvantage. Firstly, with longer levers, it's more difficult to exert an higher force due to the fact that the arm is much longer than usual. And therefore, it would be not suitable to act with it. It's also um, a matter of momentum. And you can, uh, you can find a different um, physics formula on uh, just searching on surfing on the web. And secondly, more weight means uh, to exert a larger force in order to front it. So my body uh, usually is not anatomically ready to front uh, this kind of effort, for example, for the um, full plunge or front lever pull-ups. So I need to be stronger with the respect to thinner or shorter guys in order to achieve a certain movement or the same movement. So um, it's also a matter, matter of um, range of movement. If you have longer arms, so, uh, then the path that you need to cover during all the execution of the movement is larger than normal. This is even worse than waiting more than normal because scientifically a ROM deficit is harder than a weight increase. So ROM is much bigger for tall guys than the short one. And also uh, a linear increase in height corresponds not to a linear increase in force, but a cubic one to be generated a cubic force, uh, sorry, a cubic increase in the force to be generated for to perform the same movement. 
Yeah. So, so this is physics. Uh, these are facts. Yeah. Because I always read comments like that, and I think they're wrong. Yeah, it's good that you point this out. And uh, you seem like somebody who is like really scientifically approaching his mm -hmm. training and mm -hmm. uh, reading oh, a lot okay, okay, and okay. learning a lot about the sport. Is that true? Yeah. So um, I discuss a, a lot of time with one of my friends, uh, Chao White, and he's he's a uh, he's a, a nuclear physicist, and uh, he does calisthenics. So uh, we talked about a lot of times about um, the weight uh, disadvantage and the lever disadvantage. Um, in your trainings, like what is the limiting factor? Do you have like especially one body part that you always feel that this is the, the part where it's uh, hardest? I can imagine, for example, the wrists have to be extremely strong if, they, if you ha have like mm. such a, a crazy angle plus that weight that is pushing. Uh, no, uh, I think the, the worst one is uh, uh, the long head of biceps is a, is a muscle inside here near the shoulder. And I think is the most stressed in the, in the planche, straddle of um, full planche or uh, straddle planche push-ups. Uh, and, and this is the worst one. No, I, I, I've never had problems on wrists or uh, forearms, uh, never. Wow, good for you. That's because cool. I, I, I work a lot with joint with jo mobility, okay. because I think it's a, one of the most important thing in this sport. True. In general, do you do a lot of mobility work? Yeah, usually... 10 to 15 minutes before the workout and 10 to 20 minutes after the workout. Every time? Yeah, every time. Wow. Every, every time. I know it's boring. It's really, really boring. But yeah, I think it's uh, the most important thing. Well, that's, that's good to know. Um, yeah. What's, what was the first skill that you learned? Let's jump back to your beginnings. Um, The first skill, my first real skill was the front lever. It took me, uh, if I remember, four, five months to get my first seconds in full. By real, I mean a skill that you can see in competition because I remember, for example, I used to do the dragon flag before the front lever, but it helped me a lot with the front lever too. Um That's it. It's, a, it's my first first one. This was. Wow. I also saw when I uh, checked your Instagram po profile, you also, like in the beginning, you posted front lever mostly, and then uh, it switched more and more to, <laughs> to the planche. So I already expected yeah, it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and in, in general, are you more a push person or a pull person from your genetics? And uh, I'm stronger in, uh, in pull exercises but I prefer the push ones. Okay. <laughs> okay. Interesting. So do you think you can switch the focus? Like, uh, do you think one day you will be stronger in, in push uh, movements because of your... I, I don't know. I think I'm, mm, I'm stronger in pulls uh, due to my genetics uh, and my body structure. But I, I don't know. I, I struggle every time with, with a push one. Okay. Um, yeah. Then let's let's jump into the question. Um, people uh, asked, how long did it take from the first workout ever, from the first calisthenics workout ever, to the first uh, straddle planche? Can you take us um, to this journey? Uh, so it it took me um, f from zero to the first straddle. I remember, if I remember correctly, one and a half years, and I mean the first two seconds of straddle planche. Mm -hmm. If I'm not mistaken, it was October, November of 2019. Then I had an exponential improvement in March 2020, so last year, and I did my first 10 seconds in straddle planche. And after my 10 seconds of straddle planche, I started training uh, the half lay and the full lay Planche, these two exercises are really tough 
because they require a lot of hip mobility and a lot of glute activation. And uh, I, ho uh, I hold my first full plunge from lean position, starting from lean position towards the end of May of last year. Then during the last summer, I had a stalemate, if it's correct, I don't know. And in December, I did my first five seconds in full plunge. And then in March, so um, almost two months ago, my first 10 seconds in full plunge. I know in the video that I put with my 10 seconds, it's, the form is not 100% correct. I should stretch my legs, but I'm always afraid of falling on my face. And so I unconsciously keep them a little bent. The bent legs were, was it during the full planche, what you just said? The full planche, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you can see in the video, my legs are not completely stretched, are a little bit bent. Okay. Do you think it's good to just show the perfect form? Like um, to... Oh, mm, yeah. I, you, I usually don't post too much on social because I... I don't like to to show every micro improvement that I can I can achieve maybe every week or every month. I want to show when I I, I want to post some, um, to make a post when I, I achieve a skill maybe at ninety percent. So it's not completely correct, but I I think maybe it's okay. Yeah. And like when somebody uh, writes, I don't know, it's not perfect for him. You, his legs are bent. Yeah, I say, I say, I say, you, you're right. Yeah. I also uh, wrote it down on the description of my of my video. Okay, so for you, it, it's not like an offense or something. It's just um, no, no, no. It's it's right. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> it's a compliment. Okay, <laughs> cool. Um, yeah, like. Um, How long, how does your workout look like today? Like uh, your schedule for the week? How is your workout structured during the week? Okay. Um, I'm training five times a week right now. Um, from the first lockdown, I, due to the COVID-19, I've always trained at home. And in November, my brother built for me an entire tailor-made iron structure. For example, the bar are two meter and 75 tall and with also larger diameters because it's really difficult for me to use structures that are in the parks. For example, the fixed parallels are too narrow for me. Mm -hmm. And to get back to what I was talking about, my workouts are divided into um, three workouts where I work full plunge to improve seconds and the, and the technique. Straddle push, uh, straddle plunge push-ups, straddle plunge press, uh, and one arm pull-ups. In the other two, uh, workouts, uh, front lever pull-ups, handstand, handstand push-ups, uh, and legs. And in all workouts, uh, as I said before, I do a lot of joint mobility uh, before and after. And usually my uh, schedule changes every month. Uh, where at the end of each one, I have to test my maximum, which are used by my coach to calibrate the next the next schedule. Wow, these are a lot of skills like um, front lever pull ups, straddle, straddle push ups, um, um, one one arm pull ups. Like you have a lot of skills in in your training. Um, yeah. You, the the focus is is. Do you have like a few moves that uh, skills that are the focus? And the rest is uh, the, For example, this month, the main focus is on uh, the full, always the full planche, because maybe I can have tr uh, transfer to the straddle planche push-ups. Uh, in fact, yes, uh, I could almost close the, my first straddle planche press uh, yesterday. Wow. <laughs> I still, I, yeah, I still need 20 degrees more to get to close it. Wow, that's cool. And uh, like, um, do you feel that, uh, I don't know, the, the biceps uh, strength that you gain through one arm pull-ups or front lever pull-ups, does it also help this bicep strength uh, for the planche? Uh, no, I think are different movements. 
because when I do the one arm pull-ups, uh, I use uh, a lot of legs in the first part mm -hmm. and uh, in the last one, in the, in the final part, because I'm training it on the ring, not on the bar, because on the ring is more difficult because you have to touch the ring with your chest. And in, in the last movement, in the last part, uh, you work a lot with, with your tricep. Okay. And uh, can you go more into in into depth uh, into your workouts? Like, um, how much rest do you do? Uh, do you always do like one uh, hundred percent in every workout, or like uh, at how much? Percent no, uh, my schedule um, is is a is part of a of a bigger uh, sort of plan. So I maybe a three three months ago. Uh, I started with 65% of intensity. Then the next month, the, the main exercise are different. Our, uh, our focus um, are always focused for the same skills, uh, for um, full plunge, uh, plunge uh, struggle, push-ups, uh, uh, one-arm pull-up. But the, um, the intensity increase every month, 65%, 75%, 85%. For example, two weeks ago, I was at my, um, I did my last week of the last schedule, and I was at ninety percent. Yeah. Okay. Wow. Um, do you also do deload uh, weeks or deload trainings? Yeah. Uh, for example, my schedule um, is three weeks of w or uh, full intense work. And the, the fourth one is like uh, an active deload with the, fr the last three days uh, where, I, where I test my maximum. For example, max sold in full planche, um, max reps of um, frontal lever pull-ups or uh, how, okay, uh, the one-arm pull-up uh, and, and go okay. et cetera, et cetera. And what in this uh, training schedule is your advice to somebody who w wants to learn the planche? Because we received, like, as you can imagine, a lot of questions. Uh, what's his best advice for the planche? What are what his plan secrets? Like, what in general, if you have to tell something, mm. what's, what gave you the best results for planche? Okay. Uh, first and most important thing, as I mentioned before, working on joint mobility because the planche for tall athletes is very stressful in terms of muscles and tendons of the biceps and shoulders. Second advice, don't be in a hurry. Most of the times tall people have to do much more preparatory exercise to reach a skill, especially for uh, the planche. For example, I didn't go straight from straddle planche to full planche, but I have to work on half lay, full lay, And also with the dream machine that I think is uh, the, the, the equipment that helped me the most. Oh. Yeah. Um, do you know what the, the, the dream machine is? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Maybe for the people who don't know it, it's, um, if you want to explain it. Yeah. Uh, the dream machine is a, it's an equipment that is used by professional gymnasts. I, wear a climbing harness to which I hook two ropes and that pass through a rotating pulley attached to the bar. And then the ropes are connecting on the other side to the weights. I build it by myself and I think it's the most useful piece of equipment for tall athletes because you can scale the weight precisely without having to use hundreds of, of different loop bands. Furthermore, uh, loop bands uh, have a disadvantage that they degrade over the time, no longer holding the same weight indicate. And secondly, in dynamic exercises, for example, um, front lever pull-ups, uh, plunge push-ups, uh, one-arm pull-ups, uh, you never know how much weight you're unloading uh, when the loop band uh, is, uh, is not uh, in its maximum extension. So they are useful, but they have their own limits. Wow, that's interesting. And so you, so I didn't know that you train also a lot in, in rings. Did you feel that the ring training uh, helped you a lot for um, for the planche, like uh, the stability that you gained in rings? Mm, no, rings helped me a lot for uh, for the one arm pull up. 
Okay. Because uh, I, I've just, I've always tried the full planche on on the parallettes. Okay. Never on the rings. I think it's more difficult. Ah, okay. So you have a dream machines, not with rings, but with parallettes. No, no, no. It, it, the rings uh, are, uh, yeah, yeah. I can use my dream machine also because uh, are, they are attached uh, one to the to the um, uh, to the climbing harness mm -hmm. and the other side to the weights. Mm -hmm. I can also um, switch uh, and uh, uh, hook them, hook the two ropes uh, on uh, the switch harness and uh, and then to the rings. So yeah. it's a real dream machine. Okay. This is a, it's, it's a little bit different. So uh, if I hook the two ropes uh, to the weights, I can scale in, in precise in a precise way. And uh, I can do a full planche, full planche push-ups, uh, um, planche press, uh, one arm pull-up, every uh, also front lever pull-ups. Oh, makes sense. Sounds sounds good. Um, yeah. So these are the reasons that you think that uh, you like you learned the planche um, and. Uh, maybe some smaller athletes or like athletes who have like a, even a better genetics um don't didn't um like or mm -hmm. does it also have something to do with the with the thing that you said that you have to have patience you know like you use you, you um that you don't rush um like what are the maybe also the mental things behind learning the plant honestly i don't know how others athletes train and mm -hmm. i can't say anything about it, but I can say that I reached the planche mainly thanks to my coach, Alessandro, that I say, hi, to Alessandro. <laughs> uh, if, I, <laughs> if it hadn't been for him now, I would have already changed sport, maybe. Yeah. Wow. That's a, that's a quote. So, um, like yeah. for you, it, it's, you would always, um, would you recommend to everyone picking a coach and if he wants to achieve yeah. big things in calisthenics? Yeah, because, um, I think for tall athletes like, um, like me, it's, it's quite impossible to follow the YouTube, uh, YouTube videos. I think they are a sort of quick clickbait, if you know what I mean, mm -hmm. because I think mm, there are no general, uh, there is no general way or there are no general routines that, that apply to everyone. Most likely, most likely the one that worked for me may not work for the others. So it's too subjective as sport. And I think there, there is no universal method that applies to everyone. Maybe it can work for shorter and lighter athletes, but it will definitely never work for taller and heavier ones. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you think like um, YouTube is good for maybe general information about the sport, like um, general stuff, but yeah. uh, if... if uh, if the listeners want to have like really information for themselves and uh, like a coach that can look into one's body and uh, like one's performance, et cetera, and analyze like uh, movement patterns, et cetera, it's like yeah. smarter to have a coach. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. definitely. Yeah. Um, yeah. The question that uh, you already answered a little bit is um, that people ask if you work on your legs. So um, is it possible to have this weight and this height that you have and work on, on, uh, on legs while having the full planche? This is a question that is uh, quite interesting. So yeah, tell us your opinion about leg training. Yeah, uh, yes, I train them once a week, but the gyms have closed since the last October due to the COVID-19 and the only exercise I can do is Bulgarian squats with dumbbells. And I think, yeah, it's partially a disadvantage, but also an advantage work, like work, uh, work on legs uh, with calisthenics. Also, if you're a tall athlete, let me explain better. Uh, a disadvantage because having two heavy legs would not allow me to, ab to be able to do almost <laughs> any skill. If I train my legs seriously, maybe two, three, four times a week, I will weight 110, 150 kilos, 
and no more. You know, have you ever watched uh, the Johnny Bravo cartoon in your life? I don't think so. Yeah, it, it was a sort of cartoon where this guy is like, uh, has a um, upside down uh, triangle shape, just oh, like me. Okay. So <laughs> my body has always been like that, despite having played basketball for 11 years. Uh, so it's my constitution, it's my it's genetic. But training them is also an advantage because when you do the planche, you need to have strength in the lower back and the gluteus. You have to be uh, one, you have to feel this uh, synergy with the whole body. When you work, uh, working on legs helps uh, in the planche press. And because it requires a lot of activation of glutes and also for the straddle one, active active opening of the legs. Yeah, and that's it. Okay. So train the legs, but not too much. <laughs> Does it also help to train in the right uh, rep, um, rep range, like to not build massive legs, but only um, strong legs? Mm, yeah, uh, I just train in, in a normal way. And my goal is not to have uh, huge and big legs because I, I think I, I would not reach a, a huge mass. My, my genetic is, uh, <laughs> is different. <laughs> True. But uh, how many reps do you do per, per set approximately? Is it five or is it 15? Mm, oh, um, I made four, four sets, four or five sets. Uh, and I repeat it three, four times uh, because it's the only exercise I can do at home mm -hmm. uh, with 10 to 12 reps. Okay. Cool. Um, yeah. Do you want to tell us more about your day? Like uh, besides um, uh, the the workout, like as you're uh, also with your profession as a software, software engineer, um, like um, how, how does your day look like? I usually wake up at 7 a.m., having breakfast, go to work. At, at about uh, half past 5 p.m., I start training. And then in the evening, I either study or watch videos on different programming languages or frameworks. Yeah, I'm a nerd. <laughs> And since, <laughs> since a month to now, I've been reading uh, a very interesting, interesting book on machine, about machine learning in Python we, that uses Keras, TensorFlow, and Scikit libraries. And sometimes in the evening, maybe before going to sleep, I like to watch videos about astrophysics or uh, astrophysics and quantum mechanics. Uh, so I have no special routines. Okay. But you're somebody who like likes to learn and likes to read and uh, like uh, learn new stuff, right? Yeah. That's cool. Nice. Um, let's talk about your nutrition. Um, how do you eat? How do you? How important do you think is is food for your performance? Mm, I I don't follow a particular diet. I never weigh what I eat, but I always try to eat healthy, and many times a day, maybe six, seven times a day. For example, in the morning, I eat tons of Greek yogurt, and with the whole grains. Um, at 10 p.m., uh, I eat again, um, Greek yogurt again. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, for lunch, I usually have um, pasta or basmati rice and chicken or other kind of uh, meat. And after training, I um, drink a protein sugar. And for dinner, I uh, have fish and vegetables. And before going to sleep, if um some i take some i eat some protein source without carbohydrates and fats so i don't always eat so many times a day it also depends on the on the commitments between work and university so and on but on weekends uh, i usually keep one day when i can eat what i want cool And what is your favorite uh, food on, on, on a cheat day? Mm, uh, burgers. Nice. <laughs> yeah, tons of burgers. <laughs> 
So, uh, like, uh, do you have like, um, do you, do you think like uh, the protein is really is important for your performance, or is it because you you for me it it sounded like you had like fish, meat, like uh, Greek yogurt. You in every meal you had protein. How how important yeah. do you think it is for your performance? Uh, I I think the diet is really important, along with sleeping at least six to seven hours a night. But uh, I can say that when I eat badly, I feel a decline in performance, especially in pushing exercises. So, for example, if mm, I eat too much carbos before uh, before the workout, I I feel uh, mm, I feel less less strength, mm -hmm. and that's it. <laughs> How do you think about uh, supplements? Uh, usually, uh, after training, uh, I have a protein sugar and and uh, eat a banana. That's it. Nothing more or nothing less. Sometimes uh, when I feel very, very tired, I take the BCAA and, and stop. Okay. So no creatine? Did you ever take no, it? No, never. Okay. Well, wow. Interesting. Um, yeah, let's talk about injuries. Um, what mm -hmm. injuries did you have on the way uh, until now? Yeah, tocca ferro. <laughs> Fortunately, no. However, two years ago, I got a very deep contracture of the rhomboid on my back, which lasted two two months. I no longer felt strength in any exercise. And I remember that at the time I was doing uh, the rope climbs mm -hmm. and they are very, very tough. And I couldn't do, and do them anymore. Fortunately, a very good osteopathy mm -hmm. uh, with the use of agother agotherapy with electrodes was able in a short time to get me through the contractor. So this is the, the only injured Okay, so like to prevent injuries, as you said, uh, mobility is important. Yeah. Um, how yeah. important is warm up? Um, yeah, the warm up, for example, it depends on on the workout. Uh, for example, if I have one arm pull up and and pl or any kind of exercise uh, like planche or planche push ups or planche press, I do. Um, five, five, six, six minutes of warm up. Okay. So the warm up is for me, the basic, really basic exercises. For example, I do tuck planche or um, advanced planche or tuck planche push-ups uh, or maybe 10, 10 normal pull-ups on the bar, but very slowly. And that's it. I think it's more important uh, the joint mobility. So you enter the training room and then you start with your joint mobility? Yeah, first joint mobility and then the warm up and mm -hmm. then I start the workout. Okay. And then uh, for what time span approximately? Two and a half hours. Two and a half Every hours? Time. Yeah. Well, that's Five long. times a week. Yeah. And uh, then afterwards again, 10 to 15 minutes of jo uh, joint mobility. No, right? no, no. It's a two. No, it's a two and a half hour uh, with uh, with the joint mobility. Okay. Before and after. Cool. And uh, what what is your opinion on cardio? Does it help you for? Um... Uh, when I when I quit with basketball, I think I I've never <laughs> do it again. <laughs> no, no cardio, no circuits, nothing. Well. No, I because I don't do um, endurance exercises. I have only strength and so skills, and that's it. Somebody asked also about your weighted numbers. Do you do, sometimes do uh, weighted uh, training with uh, additional yeah. weight? No. Uh, I am. I'm not strong on weighted exercises, but I never do. Uh, I've never did a specific maximum strength or weighted training. And honestly, as far as deeps for the deeps are uh, deeps are concerned, I think 
it's a little bit dangerous movement. I'm talking about dips to do with high loads because uh, I've seen a lot of people get hurt trying to lift one from 100 to 200 percent of their weight in the dips, and so I've never gone any further. So, for example, my maximum with weighted pull-ups is 80, 80 kilos. And for the dips, it's almost 90. Oh. Yeah, no. No, no, no. It's, uh, it's very low. Yeah, for but... For the dips, it's low. Still, it's, 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 uh, it's an impressive number, like, uh, in, in my opinion. But, uh, like, 80 kg and pull, that's, um, that's uh, quite strong. That's cool. But I, I prefer the skill. Yeah, I know. That's uh, that's good. Perfect. Um, yeah. Um, maybe to sum up all the, the, the experience that you now gathered in, in Calisthenics, maybe you want to sum up, like what are the three main things that you want to tell the listeners to progress quicker or like um, to have more results in, in Calisthenics? Yeah. Um, having a good coach. Mm-hmm. Don't be in a hurry. So like my motto, slowly but surely. Mm -hmm. And always work on joint mobility. Well, that's uh, cool. So if I'm the listener now and I want to go out and uh, look for a coach, what's the most important thing that I have to look out for a coach? Is it the, the personal uh, relation that it's <sighs> good or... Short interruption here. Jack asked us to put a detailed reply to this question into this interview, so he sent us an audio. Enjoy. I think it's very important to be followed by a competent person who demonstrates what he has done and who proves to have had experience and results on extremely wide audience, for example, told people. Because in this way, you are more likely to fall into that case. Furthermore, it's significant if he has trained in a related disciplines such as artistics, gymnastics, or not. An athlete who has grown up in a recognized sport like gymnastics is more likely to teach calisthenics best because in turn they have been followed by coaches who have been trained, for example, by National Olympic Committee, and so they have a certain qualification and have undergone school of indoctrination. The person thus inherits a certain method, working method, An athlete who only grew up exclusively in the park is likely to have trained randomly, and training others only as he trained, it will only be good for people identical to him. And that's it. Interesting. Yeah, I can I can understand what you where you're going. Um, what can we expect from you in the future? What are your goals right now? Where do you, where we're, what, what's the next YouTube upload, which will blow everyone away? <laughs> <laughs> okay. The first goal is to achieve um, a lot of skills. For example, take the straddle plunge press, the full plunge press. It's very tough. Being able to do eight to 10 reps of front lever pull-ups for now I can do it on just free, only free. There is one of my, there is a video on YouTube that uploaded my coach. And also the one for at one end front lever is super cool. Or end push pushups, full planche pushups, iron cross, uh, ring iron cross and the Festo. I also like the Maltese, but I think it's out of reach for me. I think it's too dangerous for my height and weight. It's also generates too much stress on the long head of the biceps. And the second goal, as I said before, uh, is to be able to participate in some competition. And I know I would never win against athletes smaller than me, but I don't care. But it will be great if weighted categories were introduced because they will allow many more people to approach the world of calisthenics and make these sports more competitive. It's always okay. my opinion. Yeah, 
like uh, if if you, if somebody listens to this and he has the same opinion, we we can uh, start a petition. Uh, so like uh, wet categories are are yeah. established um, because I can definitely relate to that. And yeah, understand. it will be a dream. Yeah, and like as you said, like you receive uh, messages, we receive messages from tall athletes who feel a little bit uh, discouraged or excluded uh, from the calisthenics world. So it would definitely be a, be an interesting step. That's that's true. Yeah. And on the other hand, it would be insane to see you competing. I don't know at Burning Gate uh, and uh, like against all the uh, all the like uh, normal athletes. I would say like uh, just being being the tallest, which will motivate a lot of people. I think. Yeah, it will be fun. It will be yeah. really fun. <laughs> <laughs> nice we're uh, slowly coming to an end um, of the interview we still have some quick questions quick answers at the end you already answered the first one what do you prefer pizza or burger, burger. <laughs> even as, as an italian uh like you say yeah. you say burger um are you a dog or a cat person absolutely a dog person okay do you, do you own a dog Yeah, a big one. It's wow. a Corso dog. The breed is a Corso. It's an Italian breed. Is it's fifty four kilos. Wow. Yeah, it's, it's huge. It's like a black panther. Wow. <laughs> wow. And you're probably the only person in Italy who can hold the dog and who can uh, like uh, who is able yeah, to. Yeah, hold I bring it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> nice. Uh, do you have a favorite location for holidays? Yeah, Greece. For now for the because of the greek yogurt yeah <laughs> <laughs> nice uh yeah what are the athletes that inspire you in your workouts um, emanuele maieli mm -hmm. the italian champion yeah. scar luxa and um, caruso wow i think they are they are the strongest the italian statics uh statics legends nice Yeah. Um, yeah. Do you have a favorite book? Yeah, I had one. It's called uh, the. It's named the Last Horizon of, uh, written by Amedeo Balbi. Amedeo Balbi is a famous Italian astrophysicist, and the book provides a sort of synthesis of modern cosmology, describing both uh, the results achieved and the limits encountered in the cognitive investigation of the universe addressed with the methods of em empirical science. Yeah. So. Wow. <laughs> that, that sounds like uh, really uh, scientific. Let's, let's call it. No, no, I didn't say nerd. I, I said scientific. Good. <laughs> Uh, yeah, you already uh, wear it on your T-shirt, maybe. But uh, what's your favorite music? What What are the, your favorite bands? Genre. Uh, genre is middle. I'm a middle head, definitely. Uh, my favorite band, I don't know, maybe Rammstein or Slipknot or Five Finger Death Punch. I don't know. I like them all. Cool. So the Rammstein are different because they are industrial middle and they are the only one in the world. And they are amazing. Awesome. Great. So, yeah, like if you listen to Rammstein, we can maybe so, uh, do the next interview in German uh, because you... you... <laughs> I, I don't know. <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> nice. Um, maybe one day. Yeah, one, one day. One day. Um, we can go on a, on a Rammstein concert then. Um, yeah, for yeah. sure. <laughs> Cool. Um, yeah, the best calisthenics event you've ever visited. Have you like? Do you visit uh, some some events yeah. sometimes? It's it's funny, but I've never been to an event oh. in my life because during uh, summer event events, I've always had university exams said I didn't have any time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, I know. Okay, so that's uh, that's also a goal, which is uh, in the future. Yeah. Cool. Um, yeah, the fav your favorite skill? Full planche, full planche press or full planche push-ups. Cool. And the last question, your message to the calisthenics community, what do you want to tell the listeners? Mm. Uh, calisthenics, I think mm, this is a fantastic sport, even it's, if it's very stressful 
on a physical and mental level, but it can be very rewarding. So don't listen to anyone who tells you you cannot do it. Only you are your own judges. Yeah, it sounds good. Sounds perfect. <laughs> sounds great. Yeah. Awesome. Jack, how, where do the people find you? We will put all the links in the description. Um, you have YouTube, you have Instagram. Yeah, I, uh, people can find me on Instagram, on jack.vinati, or YouTube is Jack Vinati. Also, uh, me and a friend of mine, White, Chow White, um, created an Instagram page two years ago called Bar Giants which brings together all the um, best calisthenics athletes in the world that are taller than one meters and 85. We decided, yeah, we decided to create this page because no one, no one else has ever done it. And we wanted to show to the world that there are also tall people who can do calisthenics, skills, weighted or acrobatics one. So if you're taller than 100, one meter and 85, and you want to send us a video, just take a look at the page on Instagram. Wow, that's that's really cool. I really love that, that uh, you also use uh, your time to, to inspire more people, uh, not only with your performances, but also like sharing and uh, giving the possibility um, to, yeah, give give other tall athletes the, the, the um Yeah, the possibility to shine and to be seen. That's cool. Yeah. And, and that's it. I just want to say hello to all the guys of the, of the page, of the group. Ciao, ragazzi. <laughs> and to my coach. Ciao, Alex. That's really cool. So, uh, yeah, we're slowly coming to an end. Jack, I'm so thankful that you took the time to do this interview, like uh, that you um, shared your all your experience that was uh, hard, like connected with hard work, with uh, a lot of coaching, with a lot of uh, mental barriers broken. So um, yeah, thanks a lot for, for your time. And before you can end the episode, I want to quickly send, say uh, thank you to everyone listening to this till the end. It's uh, been an, a long interview again. I'm extremely happy for everyone listening to this. Um, yeah for for a whole hour and i think this interview was definitely interesting uh, definitely a special one as as the 50th episode so uh, yeah if you liked it give it a thumbs up and uh, jack you can end the episode and again thanks a lot no it was a pleasure for me <laughs>